Uh, there's somebody right at the back. Uh, who's just, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it, it, it's a fair it's a fair and a real question, um, and it's always a difficult one to give an answer to. But I will nevertheless. Um, there are two kind of things. First of all, you know, there's part of me that really would like to be much more local in my own existence, and therefore my carbon footprint would reduce enormously. Um, when we take people up to the Arctic, we're on a sailing boat, so actually, you know, we have to fly them up. Yeah, yeah, sure. But once we're up there, our carbon footprint is pretty much zero. Cape Farewell operates. Uh, um, we have I have so we have solar um, gathering systems for energy on. So we have our own kind of process of actually kind of you know ge generating energy, which is kind of an offset, direct offset program. But then there is this thing called rate of exchange. And if you kind of look back to Bali, 16,000 people went to Bali, and they were all environmentalists. And what came out of it? And you kind of go, well, OK, you know, I'm taking 46 people up to the Arctic, which is a lot less distance than Bali. And therefore, the rate of exchange of throwing stuff back in is very, very powerful and very strong. And you know, I mean, then you can then go politically and say, well, you know, it's proven, I think, pretty much, you know, the American military is the biggest kind of cons uh, maker of carbon dioxide. So, you know, you're not going to go there. You're not going to get that change um, by just sitting at home and saying, I'm actually feeling very good about myself because my carbon footprint is small. So that it, it's a very serious, I'm not making it light. It is a serious question and one we give a lot of thought to. There are no panaceas that we found that actually make it work in a very simple way. Sorry, then I then but this lady does. My question well. has to do with, um, because you're bringing disparate communities together to do your work, what your process has been around developing partnerships and, and kind of evolving the work. So, you know, has it been you kind of coming, finding people to work with? Has it been a project that's kind of how do you find folks out of your kind of business area? Yeah, did you get that? I mean, it's basically how do the collaborations work we, that we make and how do we move from safe territory into a new territory? or in, in, in another territory we know nothing about. Um, we're actually becoming, and it's nice that I'm here, so in a way this is a collaboration and I'd like this collaboration to grow. So that's sort of how it happens. Um, strategically, we, um, and my board of trustees, is something we look at every year with great, you know, how can we, with a very small organization, deliver the most strategic kind of power in terms of our message? So we've kind of made the decision that we're looking very closely in working with the United States and Canada, which will be doing a lot of work with Canada right now. So, you know, you kind of go, well, okay, where is the major shift that's going to happen? I mean, Europe is kind of going, look, we're doing really good in terms of climate, but actually I think the real delivery of the solution will come from probably the United States and China. So it's very important that we work with the United States. I mean, it is very exciting what's happening here. I mean, it's grassrooty a bit at the moment, but it, there is a big, powerful machine going forward. I mean, grassroots, I mean, local, San Francisco, C40 cities, C20 cities, you know, there's lots happening. But you now got to make this machine really start to roll. And I, that then I find, you know, it, it's, there's cultural things why that's exciting to me. So strategically, it's very important for us to move into here. And then other organizations, you know, you, you're always trying to maximize on, on the voice or the, or, the, or the kind of position that we can actually generate. So if somebody like the RA, which is the Royal Academy in England, is quite a conservative um, art body, but their exhibi exhibition in November this year is all going to be based on climate, so I'm curating that for them which means I'm moving into out of safe territory of the NGOs, which I love working with, but you know, we're in the middle England here. And that's great, we've got to get them on board. And we'll use that, because we probably won't go to Copenhagen, but we'll use that as a voice piece in the media of saying, look, this is, you know, this is Copenhagen's very serious, but we'll do it from, from the UK. Um, but it's, it's a long question. I mean, it's a long answer. There will be a long answer, I mean, it's endless. And we're always debating it. I don't know the answer, but I mean, we, that's how we work. 
Sorry. It's um, there's basically the role of the, the conversation between politics and, and the creative sector. Um, okay, the Prime Minister of England, when we did our last Arctic trip, gave us a letter of support. So, you know, we work very closely with the UK government. Um, they have an agenda. What's interesting is that they think they're thinking much loosely, more loosely about their agenda. They were all about controlling widgets, that if you know, everybody just reduced their little footprint a little bit, then that would be the solution. And they're getting it, they've got to think differently. And they're really looking at the creative sector, not just us, but there are various other people, like Julie's Bicycles working with the pop industry. You know, there, there are other organizations in the UK. So the government's kind of going, oh, look, these guys are de delivering in, a certain, in quite a good way. And their cultural arm, which is the British Council, we get a lot of freedom, and they've taken us up as best practice. Um, so politicians are not... I mean, somebody once said to me, you know, the problem with the you know, responsibility of a politician is that if you stop energy going to a major city, then in five days you're already in stress situation. You know, the, all of the kind of the, the food supplies, all of the kind of sewage disposal, you know, so they, they're... They have this overriding thing saying, well, wait a minute, you've got to keep the power systems going. And there's huge responsibility. Because actually, you know, if a major city went down in terms of power supply for more than five days, then the stress to the population would just be unimaginable. So they have that kind of really responsibility thing sitting on their shoulder. The ones that I know and the ones that I work with would love to move it along much faster. Um, but then, you know, they've got to make that, they've got to line up all the ducks on the wall in order to make something, and that is called politics, and it's hard work. And they do it very creatively. So I'm, I'm not dismissing them. I like the way that they're embracing what we're doing. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the Obama administration. It would be great if they became more and more, you know, open to the dialogue between the creative sector. But the creative sector, I mean, I know here a lot of people in engineering and technology and architecture. I mean, the simple one, I mean, the architects always complain to me is that, you know, when somebody commissions a building, they kind of go, well, okay, here's the price for the building. And the architects say, no, wouldn't it be better if the running of the cost for that building for the next 10 years was figured into the cost of that building? Because then the architects would say, well, wait a minute, you don't need this air conditioning. You need a different kind of system, and that will save you shed loads of money. So just that one movement. So you know, if you could get you know, the government commissioning program for buildings to actually buy into the sector, then it would free the architects to have a much greater impact. So it just needs this dialogue going forward. And it is happening, I think, says he optimistically. <laughs> One more. Is there one more? And I think that we've done questions. That's fine. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, one more. Are there also examples of science being influenced by new order? Yeah. It, it, is it a two-way conversation between the science and the arts? It's been fantastic. Um, what the scientists thought we would do for them was illustrate their problem. And what they found out is that actually with the creative sector take their problem and then try and find and come up with completely different solutions they hadn't imagined. And that allows them to look at their own work and go, well, wait a minute, oh, I hadn't thought about looking at it this way. And the other thing is that scientists, what has happened in a way over the last kind of 1,500 years is that they've become more and more specialized and therefore work much more closely and within their own confine and have this concept that actually people won't understand what they're doing and that they can only talk to the people who will understand what they're doing. And because of climate change, then they've, they've become communicators much more. And they've risen to that challenge. It's been fantastic. So I think this process is working both ways. But they do, you know, they realize, I mean, it's like ECI. You know, they're doing this great Amazon work, but they can't get it out. They need us. They know they need us in order of communication. But if we say, look, we're going to talk about it in this way, then they, you know, that becomes a dialogue. 